And I'd just like to say what an honor and a privilege it is to come and talk to the Honors College and to talk to all of you and, and to share with you my experiences uh, at the United Nations. I've enjoyed being able to do that with my students over the years. And it's interesting, I have six previous, six students from Eastern that now work at the United Nations. And so that's a, a job that most people never think about. So go online and take a look at well, everything that's available. It's amazing. And it's, if you love to travel, you can go to The Hague, you can go to Nairobi, you can go to Geneva, you can go to New York. <laughs> and that's an opportunity that very few uh, students have ever thought about, the idea of working at the United Nations and so many different departments, so many different treaties. The UN is an association of sovereign nations. And of course, these nations are called member states. Uh, the nations of the uh, world sign on and create treaties, covenants, conventions, and agreements. And um, they, of course, sign on if it's something that that particular country is uh, in agreement with. They, um, they send their official representatives from 93, uh, 193 countries in the world. And the UN uh, officially came into existence 1945 when representatives of 50 countries in the world came together in San Francisco to try and deal with the, some of the atrocities that had occurred in World War II. The world was a very different place. The word United Nations was coined by the US President um, Franklin Roosevelt. He named the United Nations. What was their purpose? To prevent f uh, future wars, to reaffirm human rights and individual freedoms for people in the world, to maintain justice, respect for treaty obligations, and also for international law, to promote higher and better standards of life for all of the people in the world. Now, um, my work has been concerned with indigenous people of the world, the forgotten people of the world, the small minorities we find around the world. So the world has 370 million indigenous people, and those indigenous people share the same problems, the same concerns around the world. This, in spite of the fact that this is the oldest social organization in the world, groups of indigenous people. They have the shortest life expectancy, the highest infant mortality rates in the world, the uh, lowest graduation rates and school retention rates in the world, the highest unemployment rates, endemic environmental health problems, highest poverty rates in the world, overrepresented in prison populations, and this reflects the oppression and the racism of indigenous people around the world. Since the beginning of colonization 500 years ago, 2,000 indigenous cultures have literally disappeared from our world. Often, uh, they are not even acknowledged, much less uh, have their rights considered prior to the creation of our Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The most important issues to all indigenous people is the right of self-governance and the right of sovereignty. Those are the most important issues. So uh, we have the same concerns, and these concerns we brought to Geneva, Switzerland, and to the United Nations for many years, and I'll talk about that in a minute, before change came. All of these indigenous groups of the world had the same complaints, regardless of where they live in the world. First of all, they didn't create the laws or the policies that they've been forced to live with. No Indian in the United States has ever written a law. No say in their treatment. So forced relocation and putting children in boarding schools and abuse of indigenous people occurs around the world and people have no say in how they're being treated. Little or no human rights or collective rights that extended to indigenous people 
no political representation. We have right now in the U.S. Congress, we have one Indian in the House of Representatives. Is our, our, our interest uh, guaranteed? Absolutely not. So many uh, indigenous people began seeking answers to these problems. And the struggle for recognition and the struggle for equality began 95 years ago. It began in 1923 when a Mohawk uh, leader, Chief was went to the United Nations and asked to speak. And they said, who are you? And he told them who he was. They said, well, we, won't let, we can't let you in here. He was denied uh, his right to speak at the United Nations. One year later, the indigenous Maori from New Zealand arrived. And they were denied entry. So um, there was a Northern Cree Indian in Canada. His name is uh, Willie Littlechild. And he began reaching out to other indigenous people in the world and saying, we have to unite. Please come and join me at the United Nations. The native Hawaiians joined him, the Trask sisters, uh, Mililani and Hanuni Trask. Uh, Rigoberto Minshew, Tum, the Nobel Prize winner from Guatemala, uh, a Quiche Mayan Indian woman. She came, and by 1977, there were 200 indigenous people that had arrived at the United Nations saying, we want to be heard. We want to be recognized. We were not recognized uh, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1945. Indigenous people were not considered. So indigenous people from around the world uh, now come to the United States and, I mean, come to the United Nations. I get to work with the Sami from Scandinavia and from Russia, the Ainu from Japan. It was interesting when we started working um, at the UN, the Japanese government said, we don't have any indigenous people. There are no indigenous people in Japan. Two weeks later, the Ainu arrived. And they said, we are the indigenous people of Japan. We live on the island of Hokkaido in the north of Japan, and we are still here. The Euros Indians from Peru arrived at the United Nations. I had been uh, to the Euros Islands, was very familiar with their culture, was surprised to see them there. I said, how long did it take you to get here? They live on islands that they make out of reeds up in the Andes Mountains lake on Lake Titicaca, it's called. They're islands, they pull the reeds from the river banks and stake them out and they live on these islands. They live on 12 islands that they make and they refurbish these islands every two or three years with the grass from the, uh, where the river fluctuates. They did that because, he said 1,200 years ago, the, um, the Inca came, and they were too warlike. So they wanted to get away from them, and they had no way to get away from them. So they built these islands out in the middle of this lake where they've lived for 1,200 years. So I said, well, how did you get here? They said, well, we took our canoes from our island. Their canoes are made out of the reeds, too. We took the canoe to the city of Puno, and then we took a train eight hours down the Andes to the city of Cusco, which is the native capital of Peru. Then we got on a bus and went across the country to Lima. Then we got on a plane and went from Lima to Mexico City, Mexico City to Houston, Houston to New York, New York to Paris, Paris to Geneva. It only took us five days. You think they weren't interested in their rights and their recognition? Five days to get to Geneva, and they were there. The Berbers from North Africa, the Australian Aborigines, the Maasai from Kenya, the Amola from Kenya, the Samburu and the Barana from Kenya, the Maya from Guatemala and Mexico, Belize, the Zapotec Indians, Mixtec Indians from Mexico, the Kuna came from Panama, the Chittagong Hill people from Bangladesh, the Bedouins from Jordan and Israel, the Mapushi from Chile, many groups from India, native Hawaiians, Aleuts, 
in Hewitt from the United States, Chamorros from the island of Guam, Basque from France and Spain, Tartars from the Ukraine. These are all groups, Maori from New Zealand, First Nations of Canada, and 13 non-governmental native groups from the United States, all working together at the United Nations and many other groups as well. So being part of the working group was a very different experience from submitting or just giving testimony at the United Nations, just presenting issues. Because the working group, we would arrive in Geneva. All the work of indigenous people is done in Geneva. So we would spend eight hours a day at the United Nations doing battle with the uh, member nation states and their official bureaucratic delegations who opposed everything we did and everything we said. Said every word, every word was a fight except the and an. Three, three years, it took us three years to get the nation state members to say indigenous peoples, plural. Three years before they conceded and called us indigenous peoples of the world. So they were very opposed. They really didn't want groups of indigenous people coming in and writing treaties for the United Nations. So we worked, we created a landmark legal framework. Um, first, as Kathy told you, first UN document ever written by indigenous people. The 370 indigenous people live in 70 countries in the world, make up 7% of the world's population, but 80% of the world's diversity in culture, language, and life ways. In my own indigenous language, I would say, Halito Hata Chalam Pulili. That says hello to everybody, I'm a Choctaw Indian. So our languages are important. Indigenous people are the first people of an area or a territory. First people whose uh, occupation precedes colonialism and precedes that of the nation states and the political systems that we're a part of. Indigenous people control 20% of the land in the world uh, today. So indigenous groups at the United Nations um, are also not only indigenous, but they are also what's called NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So there are two kinds of NGOs at the United Nations, indigenous NGOs and NGOs that represent nonprofit groups and people like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and groups around the world. So they're there too. So the uh, non-governmental organizations um, hope to have what's called ESOC status at the United Nations, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So anyway, the groups from the indigenous groups from the United States that have NGO, indigenous peoples, non-governmental status at the United Nations, National Indian Youth Council, the Six Nations of the Iroquois, the Navajo Nation, the Cherokee Nation, the Native American Rights Fund, the National Congress of the American Indian, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, the Indian Law Research Center in New York, the International Indian Treaty Council, the Teton Lakota Nation Treaty Council, and the Prairie Indian Law Center in Kansas. So we have four tribes represented, but the majority of people going to the United Nations are uh, NGOs that represent urban Indian organizations. The uh, National Indian Youth Council in Albuquerque is uh, one of the original 13 indigenous United Nations NGOs. And the NIYC, it's called National Indian Youth Council, co-authored in 1985 the first draft declaration on indigenous principles at the United Nations. So this led to our, eventually to our declaration on the rights of indigenous people. So the um, National Indian Youth Council has played a role for many years. Now let's look, what do NGOs do? What's their function at the United Nations? 
Well, they provide expert analysis on issues that affect uh, people around the world. They serve as early warning agents when problems arise in the world. The NGOs help monitor and they uh, aid in the implementation of international agreements. They raise public awareness of important issues that are going on around the world. And they contribute essential information. Um, nation states send their representatives, NGOs, usually nonprofit organizations, send um, their members. So today, there are 4,507 NGOs in the world with this status called ECOSOC. And the, um, this allows these organizations to participate in anything that's going on at the United Nations. So if you are a, a nonprofit indigenous organization, an NGO, and you have echo, echo uh, status at the United Nations, you can partic participate in a written, giving written testimony, giving oral testimony. You can attend any official meetings. You can submit written statements prior to sessions. You can also present oral presentations. You can meet official government delegations. You can meet with other NGOs. You can organize and attend parallel events and side events. You can also take part in debates and open meetings at the United Nations. So these representatives, they get passes, we get passes, and this allows you onto the UN uh, premises each year in New York, Geneva, Nairobi, or wherever you're going to be. So of course, um, any kind of political tension that's going on in the world also plays out at the United Nations. So if Venezuela and the United States a few years ago, a lot of controversy between the two, um, before Venezuela had their complete <laughs> meltdown they've had in the last uh, year, um, there would be arguments, whatever the United States would say, Venezuela would stand up and say that's not so. <laughs> so all of it plays out. You can understand the world's problems in a microcosm there. So the nation states uh, attempt to dominate the discussion uh, at the United Nations. It doesn't work. There's no particular country that has more power or a louder voice, regardless of the size of the country, the wealth of the country, or the power of the a country. So there's equality there. And the uh, small governments have as much right and as much say as the United States or uh, China or any other country for that matter. So the ECOSOC uh, framework is extremely important. This was um, Article 71 of the United Nations Charter. And this provides um, non-government organizations uh, to actively engage at the United Nations. And it raises awareness, develops education, policy development and advocacy, joint operations with other UN bodies, and allows you to participate in the UN process. So this is the only main UN body that has a formal framework for indigenous NGOs or even any NGO to participate and work at the United Nations. So you have to get this status in order to be given the voice at the United Nations as an indigenous organization. So this coordinates economic and socially related work at the United Nations and you can then work with 14 UN specialized Agency. So if you want to contribute to a meeting that's going on with the Commission on Population and Development, you can submit an oral statement. You can give an oral statement, you can present a written statement, and your voice is going to be heard. So there are um, about a dozen uh, of these uh, commissions. Commission on Population and Development, Social Development, Commission on the Status of Women, Commission on Narca Narcotics and Drugs, Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, and the Commission on Sustainable Development. So as an NGO, you can contribute to that if you have this um, ECOSOC status at the United Nations. So we worked uh, for many years 
uh, to be heard at the United Nations. And after passage of our declaration, uh, three subsidiary bodies were created. Kathy mentioned a couple of them. Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People. And this, is, uh, this calls for the uh, High Commissioner on Human Rights to convene expert wor workshops and submit studies. And so this is research-based, and this is advice to the United Nations. So this is led by a seven-person independent group of experts, and they take testimony in Geneva um, every July. So I go every July and take an issue uh, that's uh, important uh, to the United Nations, especially an issue that isn't being dealt with um, here in the United States. And one of those issues we had been for 10 years taken to Washington, D.C., the fact that uh, Native American women have the highest rate of sexual assault and uh, rape of any group of women in the United States. And one of the reasons for that is the fact that on Indian reservations, uh, if you're not an Indian, you cannot be prosecuted. So there were groups of men, predators, that would go from one reservation to another raping indigenous women. And it led to many deaths because Native women have a fight response. Anybody that survived a colonization for 500 years usually has a fight response. They would fight back. Many of these women have been killed. We took this to Washington over and over and over and said, please give the, give the courts the right to prosecute these people that are committing crimes on our indigenous lands. Nobody listened. I took that to the United Nations. Every word you say at the United Nations comes back to your government in a matter of minutes. And within three months, President Obama said, we're gonna start a trial program and see what we can do about having these people prosecuted on reservations. So that's the kind of feedback that you get. You take the problem, you embarrass basically the United States to the entire world, and then they take notice. And so that's sad that you have to do that. So anyway, the expert mechanism uh, looks at new issues that have not been addressed. Then also the creation of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And this uh, meets every year in New York City. And it's a 16-member um, governing body, eight appointed by indigenous people, eight appointed by governments in the world. And you bring what the uh, permanent Forum is a, uh, a platform for indigenous groups in the United States to bring their problems that they're having with the United States government or problems that they're having on their lands uh, to the Permanent Forum so you can begin looking for answers to those problems. We also, uh, Patty, I mean, uh, uh, Kathy mentioned the Special Rapporteur. That's uh, one person. That's one person that's been appointed um, by the indigenous groups to address issues and problems that are occurring around the world. So for example, um, there was a case uh, in Guatemala where the indigenous Canabal Maya were being, their land was being taken away. They had tried to operate through the courts in Guatemala to no avail. They called in the special rapporteur, and the special rapporteur at that time was uh, an American, the first American uh, special rapporteur, uh, a Muscalero Apache lawyer named James Anaya. James Anaya went to Guatemala, intervened in that problem, and the Maya got their land restored. And so they act as a troubleshooter, and they have to be invited in by uh, an indigenous group. They can't just come in and say, well, there's a problem here. They have to be asked to come in and intervene, and then they interact with the, the government to say, this is what you're doing to indigenous people here is wrong. Now, uh, the present special rapporteur is from the Philippines, and her name is Vicky Corpastali, and she's Tabiba from the Philippines. And uh, this is a six-year term the uh, term of special rapporteur.
she's a woman that I met at the Fourth World Conference on Women. So I was very happy when she was appointed the special rapporteur. So the expert mechanism um, allows people to participate, all of these groups on every level you can participate in uh, entering uh, any of the UN sites. You can network and lobby for change. You can meet official government delegations. You can organize side events at the United Nations. You can uh, attend any international conference or event. And so what this does is expand the power of uh, indigenous people around the world or NGOs that have this ECOSOC status. There are six mandate areas, health, education, human and collective rights, economic and social development, environment and cultural preservation. So um, the, you can decide for yourself what issues to take to the United Nations. Some countries were flexible and cooperative, uh, especially those countries that have large indigenous populations. They tended to be much more sensitive to their indigenous people and that is understandable. Some countries that have had a part, uh, have a past history of problems with indigenous people were also attempting to correct mistakes in the past. And some of those uh, countries, Guatemala, Brazil, and Denmark in particular were very uh, sensitive and wanted to correct the problems they've had with indigenous people in the past. Other countries were not so agreeable. So in the United States, the State Department's Bureau of Democracy and Human Rights and Labor, an organization, a bureaucracy that you've never heard of in Washington, became heavily involved for about five years before the passage of our Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which occurred September 13th, uh, 2007. And this was the five years during the Bush administration. So the State Department uh, attempted to neutralize the document. They attempted to undermine the movement for recognition and protection of indigenous people around the world. The United States wanted the declaration to remain consistent with U.S. Indian law, which is much narrower than what we were proposing. Nation states were afraid of their indigenous people. They were afraid that indigenous people would ask for and could receive restitution for what had been done in the past, for any past injustice, like taking of land, territories, or resources from the land. They're also afraid of them because indigenous populations cannot be deported. They're also the most egalitarian societies still on earth, and this scares a lot of countries that lack uh, equality and lack that whole notion of an egalitarian society. So indigenous societies often in direct conflict with nation states over a variety of issues. It might be mining, it might be damming of rivers, There's, it might be uh, creation of uh, oil and gas leases on indigenous lands, people that uh, are opposed to that. So they're often at uh, odds on a variety of issues. The uh, nation states do not, none of them recognize matriarchal societies. Many of the indigenous societies in the world are matriarchal. Virtually all of the African tribes are matriarchal. Two thirds of all tribes in the United States are still matriarchal. The chief of my tribe is Phyllis Anderson, who is my cousin. So the equality between uh, men and women in Indian country is very, very different than what we find in mainstream society. The uh, nation states, in many cases, want the lands that indigenous people still own and control in many parts of the world, especially when they find something like oil or gas or uranium 
on those lands, then they want those lands. Capitalism often undermines the status of indigenous people. Indigenous people uh, throughout the world are not very good capitalists. And that's an uh, understatement. Indigenous people, constant reminder of the evils of colonialism and the evils that have been perpetuated against indigenous people in the past. They also fear secession on the part of indigenous people. So 1977, uh, the work began by our Mohawk chief. By 1977, 200 indigenous people arrived at the United Nations and said, we want a voice. So the uh, United Nations responded by creating a, a, a one day, um, a one day Indigenous Peoples Day. But this led to 1982 of uh, the creation of the UN Working Group on Indigenous People. And the work continued for the next decade uh, and into 1993. 1993 was proclaimed the Year of Indigenous People. United Nations General Assembly went on to proclaim a decade, 1995 to 2004, as the International Decade of Indigenous People. I became a part of that working group in 2002 in Geneva. And we worked on a draft declaration that had pre been presented uh, and began change in 1993 and had been on the table for a decade. At the end of 2004, only three of our paragraphs had been approved. So it looked like a failure. And the United Nations was, they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed that we had been working for over 10 years and three uh, articles had been approved. And it took, I just mentioned the, even the uh, calling us indigenous people. So there was a huge resistance to indigenous people uh, uh, writing declarations and demanding their rights at the United Nations. So the, um, the second decade was approved, and this was 2005 to 2015, and this became uh, the years that we went on to uh, claim victory in our Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So this was productive in securing rights, including collective rights. One of the hardest and most difficult things we had uh, to educate nation states about indigenous people was this notion of collective rights. They understood human rights because of the work that had been done and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So they understood that. They did not understand the idea of collective rights. So native people, indigenous people of the world have a notion of collective rights, collective land rights. Everybody owns the land. Collective uh, places where we gather our plants, where we gather our sacred plants. The state of Alabama was named by my tribe, and Alabama means the place where we gather our plants. That was the place where my tribe went to gather our sacred plants four times a year. And so um, also collective rights to burial grounds. They didn't understand collective rights, and it took years before they understood the importance of collective rights to indigenous people. So we won on that. Also, uh, the tree enforcement of our treaties and the sovereignty of indigenous people around the world. So um, we believe they had the um, responsibility, they have the responsibility to ensure the rights of indigenous people. And when the final vote came, the um, four countries voted against the declaration that we had been working on for all those many years. And the four countries were Canada, Australia, 
New Zealand, and the United States, the four English-speaking direct descendants of the British colonizers. All four of those, all four of those governments voted no in the passage of our Declaration. And this led to an ongoing struggle that we had for many years. The uh, passage of our Declaration, 22 paragraphs, 46 articles that include the most important aspect is the notion of free prior informed consent. So what we were concerned with, the most important thing that came out of our declaration was the free prior informed consent. You can't do anything uh, without our free prior and informed consent on our traditional lands and with our indigenous people. And March the 2nd, a few weeks ago, the United States government failed to consult indigenous people when they took 4,400 acres of sacred native land, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, and they were going to, they seized that land and said we're going to uh, put this out for oil and gas leases. Well, they failed to consult native tribes, native people very aware of that, native people fought back, and last week, Mr. Zinke uh, acknowledged that they would change their mind, that they were not going to um, lease this land to oil and gas companies after all. After our declaration passed, um, my tribe got our burial grounds back. We have a, a place that's called Nayanwaya, and it's sacred mounds, and those mounds were returned to us. And it was a direct result of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The Klamath Indians had 90,000 acres that had been seized by the state of Washington, returned to them a direct result of our treaty. So we see and we feel that it's working. So this gives us collective ownership and rights to our land, a prohibition against forcible removal from lands and territories by any native people, right to practice cultural traditions, rituals, ceremonies, and protection of our sites that are sacred, archaeological sites, and also the protection of our intellectual property rights, right to practice traditional healing and our various health practices, fair compensation for land that was taken with no compensation in the past, right to uh, conservation, protection of our environment, on our lands, freedom from discrimination, children's rights to education, and all forms of violence uh, should end, consultation on all issues. So the major point of our 22 paragraphs and 46 articles were extremely important. So all four of those countries that voted against our declaration have since that time signed on. Australia, the Aborigines in Australia convinced their government April 1st, 2009 to sign on. New Zealand, the indigenous Maori people, I just mentioned that these countries are afraid of secession. The indigenous Maori control one-fifth of all the land in New Zealand. And they simply um, said to their government, if you do not sign on to this treaty, we would have to consider the idea of secession and become Maori land. That governments don't like that. You see what just happened in, in Spain when they tried to secede in Catalonia. So they don't like that. So they said, well, we'll sign on. Canada opposed. Stephen Harper was the uh, prime minister at the time. Mr. Trudeau would have been exactly the opposite. But uh, Stephen Harper, October 2010, said, we're going to sign on because we don't want to be the last country in the world to sign on to this. And so they signed on. A month later, the United States signed on, December 17, 2010, and that was President Obama that signed on. If that had been George Bush, I don't think there would have been any signing on to our declaration. 
President Obama proved himself very quickly. We were very pleased. So all of these four countries had a long history of oppressing uh, indigenous people, and um, they all have been turned around since that time. So every country in the world has signed on to our treaty, and it became the most comprehensive statement on the rights of indigenous people ever in the world, provides a legal framework uh, under the international law for the first time in our history. Consensus was reached and adopted by the Human Rights Commission prior to the declaration being adopted by the General Assembly. Negotiations that had began 95 years ago and serious negotiations at the United Nations that had lasted 20 years. So um, we were very pleased to say that we were finally successful and that um, the legacy that began in 1923 was realized, not only September 13th, 2007, but also when the United States was the last country to sign on in December 2010. So it was a job well done by indigenous people of the world. We would spend eight hours working at the United Nations, then we would meet after to plan our strategy for the next day, so it was 12 and 14 hours a day that indigenous people worked for many years. Um, several weeks of the, of the year we came together and finally we had the passage of our uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So with that, I'll take, anybody have any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You mentioned uh, about war struggles and issues, uh, the issue of not having created love for the importance of that, and um, mm -hmm. issues of you know, saying treatment and then both of them are right. 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 Well, we're still meeting, we're still working, and we will continue to work. One of the important things about being now accepted and acknowledged at the United Nations, because we have been successful, has given us credibility, and they're no longer pushing back. You know, they push back against our involvement. They push back for many years against uh, us even being there. Now they recognize us as a viable political force, and they know we're not going away. And we recognize that we're becoming very threatening. I have to tell you something that happened yesterday. The special rapporteur, Vicky Tolly, from the Philippines. The government of the Philippines yesterday announced that she was going to be put on the um, Philippines terrorist watch list as a terrorist and that her organization, Tabiba, that she came out of and worked at the United Nations, this is United Nations Special Rapporteur, and she's being called now a terrorist and the indigenous organizations in the Philippines are being called terrorist organizations. And these are people that have worked for 25 years on peace with no terror, <laughs> no violence of any kind. And so that tells you that she is extremely threatening and what we're afraid of is that this could, this could escalate and also be done in other places in the world. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's, uh, it's fearful because we have, we have no ability again to push back on that. So all we can hope for is that the people, the indigenous groups in the Philippines are pushing back already. Today there was already a petition online, but um, Duarte in the Philippines is pretty scary, pretty scary guy. Yeah, so he's called our special rapporteur of terrorists. So, any other questions? 
Yeah. Which U.S. presidents do you consider to have been the most supportive of the rights of indigenous peoples in this country? And President Obama, number one, President Obama. Um, and strangely enough, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was, um, his mother was a Quaker. She had done a lot of work with uh, Indians in the United States. And she had uh, influenced his attitudes toward, toward uh, indigenous people. So he was very sympathetic to the plight of indigenous people. And of course, the Kennedys. Bobby Kennedy closed the ill-fated boarding schools where 185,000 native children taken from their homes by force, by law, and put into the ill-fated boarding schools where they were sexually abused, physically abused, spiritually abused. And the purpose of the boarding schools was never education. The purpose of the boarding schools was assimilation. Again, an attempted effort to get rid of us by assimilation. And so, the, in fact, Alan Fox, that was vice president of the uh, National Indian Youth Council, there again, went to Washington and met with Bobby Kennedy and said, these boarding schools are destroying our communities. These boarding schools are creating intergenerational trauma in our schools, and they must be closed. And Bobby Kennedy closed them. They had been open 125 years. And so this is, creates problems we have on our reservations and in our communities today. The whole issue of trauma in each generation that was never dealt with. And so we're still suffering as a result of that intergenerational trauma. Questions? Yeah. Well, I think what's important for social workers is to understand that uh, indigenous people have a very, have a different status than everyone else in the United States. And it's not based on the notion of race, it's based on the fact that we were here before there was a United States, we were here before there was a border called, uh, between called Canada and Mexico, and that our status is unique because we are the only groups that signed treaties. 367 treaties were signed by Native people. Those treaties are still enforced. Those treaties are still operative. Those treaties are still there. And so our status is very different than anyone else's status. And so I think there are uh, 2,000 laws that govern Indians that don't govern anybody else the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Indian Religious Freedom Act, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, the Indian Language Act of 1994. We got the right to speak our own languages when Bill Clinton was president. We got our religious freedom rights in 1978. And so these are laws that were attempt to control indigenous people and their whole idea was to get rid of us. It almost worked. In 1900, there were only 200,000 Indians left in the United States, and they had predicted our, our demise. And of course, many tribes did not survive the coming of the uh, colonizer. You know, the Appalachia were a tribe. The Massachusetts were a tribe. The Mobile were a tribe. The Dietzo were a tribe and go on and on. These tribes are gone. All that's left is their name on the land somewhere. And nobody even knows they were ever a native tribe. Here at Michigan, you know, now they've got English as the official language. Well, I'm sorry, Michigan is an Algonquin word. It's not English. The city of Okemos. Okemos was the nephew of Chief Pontiac. Petoskey, Michigan, anybody from Petoskey? was named after the Odawa family called the Petoskeys. There are hundreds of Petoskeys. That was the village of their great-great-grandfather. And so, so little is known and so little is taught. 
that it creates lots of problems for us because people don't understand that unique status. But if you're going to work with Native people, learn what those laws are that would govern social work like the Indian Child Welfare Act, which becomes very important. And that law, by the way, the Indian Child Welfare Act, was written by a Native professor that was right here at Eastern, Dr. Ron Lewis. He was a Cherokee. He was the first Indian in America to get a PhD in social work, and he didn't like the idea that our Native children were taken and being put into non-Native homes. He could see that that was destroying our culture, especially when our numbers were so few. And Dr. Lewis that taught here at Eastern, retired from Eastern about 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, the person that convinced me I should come here. <laughs> anyway, he wrote the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so uh, things have occurred here and people have absolutely no idea no idea. They have no idea that we have uh, separate and distinct laws that govern only Native people. And so trust is always an issue with Native people. If you're going to be a social worker working with Native people, it's what you do that counts, not what you say. And you'll be watched very carefully until they know they can trust you. And that's not an easy trust to gain either because too many things have happened over too many years. Okay, there were other questions. Yeah. Um, Wait, I can't hear you. So with the recent tax bill that was passed to open the Anwar refuge areas for drilling, as I understand it, there are concerns that drilling for oil in those areas could affect on the livelihood of the indigenous people there. Are you guys seeking any sort of action against that? Because the kind of We sure do. The problem is we are very small. We are one and a half percent of the population in our own land. And most, I find most Americans go their entire life, they never know an Indian. They have never met or had a conversation with an Indian. And so we are, we're putting out fires not only uh, in Michigan, but across the country. And uh, the, like the situation at Standing Rock last year, that brought Native people from all over the country. And Native people are very concerned about the protection, uh, not only of our land, but very concerned about the protection of the water. The water is extremely important, sacred, and needs to be protected. We're, that's, all of those issues are extreme importance. And we also don't want drilling and um, exploitation of our lands and territories that are considered sacred, like that land around Chaco Canyon. Yeah, and the pipeline number five here across the Mackinac Straits. I took that to the United Nations too, that the pipeline issue was another issue. The year I took water, the interesting thing about our Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we have thousands of people working on an issue and we realized when it was all over and it passed and everything was wonderful that we didn't say enough about water. So I took that issue to the United Nations and got back and two months later the Flint water crisis blew up. <laughs> so it's really, uh, those issues are, are timely and they're, we don't run out of issues. That's unfortunate. We'd like to run out of issues. Yeah. Questions? Yes. We haven't given up on that. No, we, we're not going to give up on that until there is no options. Yeah. We want to stop those pipelines. Leave it in the ground is the attitude. The leave it in the ground movement. Yeah. So anyway, any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity.